dealing with Muslim communities both before I went to the U.S. and after I went to the U.S. And uh, to revive a dream that my father has always had. A dream of uniting the Ummah. The dream of spreading the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. The dream of establishing a healthy, not necessarily only physically, but of course physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally healthy community and society. But before I jump into the topic, first of all, I want to tell you my English is 16 years old English. For those who were my classmates, would you mind please if you stand up? Those who were my classmates in the Islamic University of Nigeria. They knew me, and these are people who actually I spent great, please be seated. Uh, I spent great time of uh, my life, educational life in college with them, and they knew me, I didn't speak any English at that time. So I feel very embarrassed today to uh, stand in front of them claiming that I speak English. Uh, the second thing I would like to also acknowledge, I have the Sheikh on my right side, and actually the Mashayikh on the panel, who have worked a lot, who have been given a lot, in the Muslim, to the Muslim community here in Kano and beyond. And in fact, Sheikh Ibn Uthman reached actually to where I came from, the US. I would say I'm honestly embarrassed to sit next to him, claiming that I will share with you a knowledge. And that's why I will issue a disclaimer first. Whatever I say that is correct is from Allah Azza wa Whatever is wrong is from myself and from Shaitan. And I'm giving permission to every single one of you to correct me. I'm giving an authorization. If I'm sharing any misinformation, please do not wait until the end. Stop me right there. Please. Because knowledge is a man. Our goal is not to show off today. Our goal is not to flex in muscles. Our goal is to come together as Ummah and solve a serious problem that our Ummah has, is facing. And the first problem that I would like to address is probably a universal problem. The problem of deviating from the path that the Prophet ﷺ left us on. تَرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْمَحَجَّةِ الْبَيْضَارِ لَيْلُهَا كَانَ هَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَارِكَ I have left you on a clear path that its night is so clear that as if it is its day. And no one will be devi deviating from that path except the misguided person. And today, we have million, actually in fact, we have 1.8 billion Muslims around the world. And the majority of the Muslims, I'm not exaggerating, we have been deviating from the path that the Prophet ﷺ left us on. You might say, where did I get these statistics from? I did not do any formal statistic, but I see and we all see the result. The result from being a pioneer ummah that led the nations around the world in morality, in manners, in science, in medicine, in technology, in finance, to where we became in the tail of the nations. From an ummah that people in Europe, I will give you just a small example. Now our students, their dream is to go to Yale University or Harvard or to Oxford to get a degree. The Europeans dream was how to attend an Islamic university in Andalusia. When the European were living in the medieval years, and in fact, now today we have Muslims who say Islamic medieval. No, we are currently in the Islamic medieval. The European medieval was the Islamic golden age. The question that I have for myself first, and for you, what got us to the level that we are in today? Our priorities 
Yes, we will go to the presentation. I'm very hard to follow rules, actually. I don't follow my own rules, so uh, I apologize. But we will get on the, in the presentation soon, soon, inshallah. The goal, how can we resurrect the ummah from the situation that we are in today? An ummah that Allah Azza wa Jalla said about us, Kuntum khayra ummati bukhrijat dinnas. You are the best nation that Allah has ever created for humanity. How can we regain that natural position? How can we lead the nations again? And Imam Malik says, more or less, لا يصلح آخر هذه الأمة إلا بما صلح به أوله. If we really wanted to get the strength that our forefathers, the Sahaba and the Tabi'in, and Tabi'in, Tabi'in, خير القرون قرن ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم, is we have to follow their path. And this is exactly the reason why we're here today. I'm not here to teach you on how to be that effective element in the society. I'm here to remind you about your role. I'm here to hear from you, actually. How can we work together on making sure that we resurrect the Ummah together? Because it is not one person's responsibility. In fact, it is all of us's responsibility, my brothers, beloved brothers and sisters. Again, I was mentioning earlier, I don't know who's running the, the presentation, by the way. Okay. The MC, man, a lot of words. I don't know what can we do without you. I wanted to start first by thanking Allah Azza wa Jalla. Without Allah Azza wa Jalla, none of this is possible. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Indeed, there is no blessing that has come to you except it is from Allah. The second, I would like to pay tribute and thanks to my late father, who actually, his grandfather, used to be a nomad. He used to travel from one city to another city between Chad and Sudan to teach. He would settle in a city, teach the youth in the city of Quran, and then he moves on until he died in Sudan. When my grandfather died, my father was 16 years old. He decided to go to Egypt. Then from there he went to Saudi Arabia by an invitation by Sheikh Ibn Baz when he was the uh, president of uh, the Islamic University of Medina. When he went there, his top priority was not his mom or his sisters or his brothers. He wasn't married at that time. His top priority was, how can I make sure the children who are not related to me, but they were from our community, they are getting the education that they deserve. So he started single-handedly, trying to tell our community in Saudi Arabia, particularly in Medina, telling them that you have to send your children to school. They wouldn't listen, because everybody was in Saudi Arabia to get, make money. So what he did, actually, he kidnapped children. So he was a kidnapper. When he did, he would come at night when the parents are not home. He would snipe these children while they were sleeping. He would put them in a mini bus and take them, took them to Riyadh. And he established a school called Darul Ikhwan and it is operating until today. When he passed away, I received a lot of messages. I have met a lot of people who have become influential in the society and they were telling me we're so sorry for your loss. Your father was our father. And my question to them, who are you? He, they said, we were the kids who your father kidnapped. And these kids or these youth or then youth, they are leaders today. And the students who are from the Islamic University of Niger doing very well. I used to feel jealous because he would actually prioritize other children over me. I would say, why he loved them more than he loves me? You know, in one incident, I had a rooster. Is it called rooster here in, in English, in English, British English? A deep. It's a deep rooster, right? So I had a deep that was fighting another rooster. And then, you know what he said? He made, uh, he made dua 
for Allah Azza wa Jalla to give the other rooster victory over my rooster. Why? He said, I would rather for you to be oppressed than being an oppressor. Today I'm here to complete or to work on his journey that he started. I want to thank and pay tribute to Brother Bukhari, who has spent countless hours putting this event together. I would like to thank Dr. Abdul Aziz from the US, Texas, who have worked diligently to make this possible. I would like to thank you for making the time. I know you might have really other things to worry about than coming here and listening to this lecture, but you have decided to come here to spend time. So I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to reward you. Bless you, tibtum wa tabam wa shakum, wa tabawwattum wa tabam jannati maqada. Thank you for anyone who made this actually job so easy on me. I was talking earlier about the condition of the Ummah. We talked about the deviation that we see in the Ummah. We see the distance that our youth and our professional, and I'm targeting them specifically today, because they are some of the most important elements in our society. When they distance themselves away from this deed, we are signing the death certificate of our own. And the second problem is a lack of compassion and empathy. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us, مَنْ لَا يُرْحَمْ لَا يُرْحَمْ مُحَمَّدٌ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدٌ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ مَنْعَهُ أَشِدَّاهُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَانُ بَيْنَهُمْ Muhammad ﷺ is a messenger of Allah. And those who are with him, they are firm with the disbelievers. Because they are true to their faith and to their aqeedah. But they are compassionate with their fellow Muslims. Now we see this is opposite. Our leaders are so compassionate with the disbelievers. But they are so firm and careless about the believers. Poverty is not actually a secret. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because we don't want to spend too much talking about issues. The only reason why I'm addressing these issues, not to draw a pessimistic picture, but because to talk about the issues, we need to learn about the evil and the issues that we are going through in order to address them. Many times our societies are going through issues, we try to uh, you know, brush them under the rug and we don't want to talk about them. Just because we don't talk about them, it doesn't mean they do not exist. What happens, they will actually incubate. And these problems will grow. And then they, it will become, eventually, an epidemic. Then they will become a pandemic. Then they will become an endemic. A simple issue, the issue of drugs. The issue of poverty. And many times we talk about issues, and we talk about symptoms, and we don't talk about the real root causes. Now, if you ask yourself, or we ask people, whose problem is this? Whose responsibility are the problems that we are going through? There are some people who will say the age that we are in is the reason. Since Allah has created the earth, the calendar is 12 months. Hijri calendar, let's go by that. Even the Gregorian calendar is 12 months. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is the same month, it, we have the same month today. The same week is seven days. So let's, let us not blame the time. And there are some people who blame everyone except themselves. Say, so, oh, people are bad today. People are corrupt today. SubhanAllah. We are talking about people. And SubhanAllah, we talk about Amana. The Sheikh was talking about it earlier. We talk about the Amana is gone. And we ourselves don't care and respect our Amana. So these are the problems that we are facing and where they are coming from. It is us. We should not blame anyone. We should ask ourselves, what is my role in the problem that is going on? 
Where did I miss the point? Where am I miscontributing in the society? Actually, not even miscontributing. Where am I sitting idle? Because when you see the wrong and you are not doing anything to change it, then you are part of the wrong. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ أَطْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ Now, unfortunately, now the munkar has become a ma'roof. We are numbed. You see that, you know, people are hungry, but you don't even care about it. Your neighbor, your neighbor is hungry. And the Prophet ﷺ says, وَاللَّهِ لَا يُؤْمِنْ مَنْ بَعْتَ شَبْعَانْ وَجَارُهُ جَائِعَ this is a basic civic engagement that we, the concept of civic engagement. So what is your role? Many times, when we go into the Western world, you have to have an anthropologist, social, sociologist, or philosopher trying to solve the issue of the woman, or the nation, or the societal issue that we are going through. Islam is a simple religion. The more you can make it complex, the harder the solution gets. And that is why I went to what Imam Malik says. Shafna, wherever you want me to stop, inshallah, I will be more than going to the show. Um, is really sweet language. Even though I don't speak it or I, I don't understand much of it, but I, I see the, the sweetness. Inshallah, I hope that will be my next job, inshallah, learn in house. So the next time I come, I will speak in house, inshallah. Uh, so, most of the time we talk about the issues of the Ummah on a big level, on a macro level. Let's go back to the micro level. And when I say micro level, let's talk about ourselves. Just like the MC was saying earlier, the Ummah is made of societies, and the societies are made of families. And families are made of individual people like you and I. And the Ummah is like one body. You know that we all were created from one single cell, and that cell is multiplied by two, then by four, then by eight, until it grows into a trillion of its size. Tabarakallahu ahsan al This is the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were created by a single cell, and that cell is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came single-handedly. No one believed in him. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knew that he will be facing challenges. He could have supported him with superpower, but he didn't give him any of that. He gave him mu'jiza, the mu'jiza of the Quran. And then he let him do and fulfill the mission as a human being. And this is a message to all of us, that the change always comes from us. And Allah Azza wa Jalla sent the Prophet to be a human being so that we can actually follow his suits, his footsteps. That's what Allah Azza wa Jalla says. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مُسْوَةُ الْحَسَنَةِ Indeed, you have in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a role model. For every single one of us, don't say, my neighbor is not applying Islam, or my brother is not, or my sister is not doing the right thing. Allah Azza wa Jalla tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لا تكلف إلا نفسك Allah Azza wa Jalla, the role of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وما على الرسول إلا البلاء And Allah Azza wa Jalla will not hold him responsible for what others do So we are responsible individually So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was said He did not start giving big speeches He did not start having muhadarat No he stopped talking to individuals. And who he picked? The closest person to him. Who? His wife. Now, maybe when I say the closest person to you, you, you might think it's Abu Bakr. No, the closest person to you is your wife. And that's why he came back to his wife saying, Zambiloni, Zambiloni. He didn't go to Abu Bakr, he didn't go to his uncle. He came to actually his wife because the wife is Sahiba. The wife, she is your garment and you are her garment. And that's why the Prophet said, come back to her and told her, this is what happened to me. And the wife, look at the model of the wife. She said, you are a noble person, Allah Azza wa Jalla will never let you down. And then she believed in the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then Ali believed in him. Then Abu Bakr believed in him. What are we learning from this? 
is the da'wah that we do individually. Go and knock on people's doors. Talk to your friends. Talk to your neighbors. Look, the federal countries, is Nigeria a federal country? That means each state has its jurisdiction, right? How the jurisdiction, the federal jurisdiction, it is decentralized. That means each community can actually play a role in changing the society. So what I would like to get from this today is how we can go back to our neighbors, go back to our families, go, to, go back to the neighborhood that we are in, and start talking to people who are your neighbors, saying, my neighbors, these are the issues that we are going through. These are the issues. We have the issue of poverty. We have issues of, of insecurity. We have issues of um, drugs, for instance. We have issues of lack of education. Don't rely on government. In Islam, we have never taught to rely on a government. We have always taught to rely on Allah Azza wa Jalla first and govern ourselves. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm not trying to say go against the government. No, this is not my message. But the Prophet Sallallahu model was to work on reforming the society. You know, this hadith, even though it was actually, there is a, a saying in it, the meaning is true. The way you are, that's how your leaders are. are, are. They're a reflection for who we are. And therefore, before you actually go and cast your vote, change the president, change the governor, ask yourself, how can I work on myself to be a good element in my society? How can I take the responsibility of changing the society? And this is what Abu Bakr did. When Abu Bakr accepted Islam, he did not say, Alhamdulillah, I am a good Muslim now. He went and recruited six from the Mubashari bin Jajr. And that's why your job is not, it's not enough to be a good person. No, it's not. وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ لِيُهْلِكَ الْقُرَىٰ بِظُلْمٍ وَأَهْلُهَا مُسْلِمُونَ وَلَمْ يَقُلُوا أَهْلُهَا صَالِحُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla is not going to destroy or punish a society collectively and the people of that society are reformers. So as long as we have people who are reformers in our society, we are in good hands. But the moment you say, okay, I only worry about myself, this is when the trouble starts. And that is why when you see fire in your neighbor's house and you do not extinguish it, it will soon get to your house. And the Prophet ﷺ started his da'wah real propaganda, social media. I'm very active on social media. But this is not how we solve serious issues. Serious issues should be boots on the ground. Serious issues should be interacting with people. And the Prophet Sallallahu he when he started the da'wah, he was like, sorry for the language, but he was like a salesman. You know what salesman does? You have a product, you want to sell it? You have to tell me what this product, how does it benefit me personally? And the message of Islam, the first message, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, is La ilaha illallah. Do you know why? Because it is mental liberation. Look, it doesn't matter how free you are, physically. If you are mentally enslaved, you are still slave. Because today, what is going on today, we are physically free. But the Western propaganda and the machine and the marketing is controlling our children and our youth. What is doing? They get on TikTok, get on Instagram, get on Facebook. They will design this fictionary person saying that this is the person who you need to look like. And Allah, this person's life is full of problems. So what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, it was a soft power. He changed, he started working on liberating people's minds first. We have to free our minds from the hawa of this dunya, from the love of this dunya, from believing that my hand, my matter is in the hands of someone beside Allah Azza wa Jalla. And that's why La ilaha illallah, it means I am not subjected to anyone or to anything except Allah. I am not subjected to my hawa, my desires, I am not subjected to shaitan, I am not subjected to the shaitan of the jinn or the human being. Unfortunately, the shaitan of the human being is worse than the shaitan of jinn now. Because shaitan of jinn, you don't see him. He was with Sufi Suguri now. But the shaitan of jinn will come and take your hand and take you to nightclubs. Take your hand to go and drink alcohol. Take your hand, go and commit foreign fornication. Allah Musta'ah. 
So the model of the Prophet ﷺ first is building an independent Muslim who is proud to be Muslim. Who would say, I am Muslim whether you go on the moon or on the Mars? You know, we have our you know, Muslim brothers and sisters, when they start becoming more you know, rich or wealthier, they start distancing themselves away from the deen. No, that is when you need to be proud of your deen. And the moment that we are proud of our deen, then we will be ambassadors of this deen. And the Prophet ﷺ spent 13 years in Mecca establishing just that. And the second thing is morality. A nation without akhlaq has no foundation. And the akhlaq is always on micro level, on individual level. Ask yourself, how is my manners? How's my characters? You know, you see me out now, I'm smiling and mashallah, everything is good. This is not akhlaq. Everyone can be nice in public settings. True akhlaq is when you are tested. When you are tested in your manners, when in your behavior, when somebody comes and insults you, how would you react? Are you going to be Or you will say, you will exemplify the eye of Allah Azza wa Jal. Or are you going to be among the crowd between the light? Are you saying, I'm good mannered? You know, subhanAllah, many of us are really nice and kind when we meet other people. But when you go to your family, are you really nice enough? Are you really kind enough when the Prophet says, khayyukum khayyukum wa ana So building these moral characters, building identity first, second, building moral characters, is the reason why the Prophet spent the air of Mecca. Honestly, today, as Muslim woman, we need to start from that level. We really need to go back. We need to work on our aqidah first. You know, most of the time when we talk about aqidah, I'm talking about the subject. The true aqidah is aqidah that dictates your actions and your reaction. Aqidah that will manifest in your words and in your, in your, in, in, in your, uh, in, in your deeds. That is the true aqidah that reflects in your, in your behavior. That's why when the Prophet ﷺ said Jafar to uh, Abyssinia. You know, Jafar did not mention a lot of Umur al He started by saying what the problem was. He says, Kunna qawman ahna jahiliya, na'adhu al-Islam, wa na'adhu al-Maytan, wa na'adhu al-Fawahaj, wa na'adhu al-Jiwar, wa na'adhu al-Fawahaj, wa na'adhu al-Fawahaj. He says to the king of Abyssinia, who was not Muslim, he said, we were people of ignorance. We used to worship idols that we created using our own hands. We used to oppress one another. We used to misbehave with our neighbors. We used to eat dead animals. We used to cut off our relatives, our ties. How many people today they don't talk to their brothers, their siblings? How many? Jaffer said, we were in this condition. This is logically, it's not a good situation, is it? It's not. So the king would resonate. We are in this condition until Allah Azza wa Jalla sent this man who we knew he was from us. So the change that would come to our society, it doesn't come from America. Okay, by the way, I'm okay for my car to be made in America. I'm okay for my wife to be made in China. But I don't want my Islam to be made in America. I want my Islam to be made in where? From the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet And that Islam, is the Islam that the Prophet said and equipped Jafar with, and he delivered it to who? To the Najash who was not Muslim. And he says, this man came from us. That's why we don't want to come, the, the change to come from someone from foreigner. The change should come from you, my brothers and sisters. And then, Allah I will pause here. And then he, he says, this man came and changed all this back. So he took us from the darkness into light. And I think we'll have to stop in a few minutes because I know we don't, I don't want to take you beyond one, uh, one o'clock as well. Okay. But before the translation, in the concept of sacrifice, it is not, and it should never be about what Islam gives me, is what can I do for Muslim women. This is the mentality that the Prophet ﷺ had. 
This is the mentality of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Al-Ain. Their goal is the Akhirah. By the way, all this lecture today, if it is not about the Akhirah, there is no business for us. Because it doesn't matter how beautiful we make our life here and our Akhirah is ruined, then there is no benefit in it. What we are doing today is making our life better here in order to have even a better life in the Akhirah. So if, if we actually simplify or summarize the concept of Ummah in only worth the benefit, then we are losing the purpose. The whole goal is how to get in the Jannah. This should be absolutely the primary goal. But whatever we are doing today is yes, we wanted to make sure that we are living decent life in this world as well in order to, inshallah, smoothen our life to the Jannah. You know, some people write, write Ferrari, some people write Lamborghini. Some people write Toyota. They all do the same job, do they? They take you from point A to point B, right? Is that correct? But the, the, the dunya is just a vehicle. Some people, their Ferrari is here in this life, some people, they're, it's there. some people, they are walking. It's a, but subhanAllah, what makes us different is how much we are sacrificing. And that is why, when everybody think about the other person, and what can I do to put this, to further this, the cause of this Ummah, then this Ummah will automatically be strong. But every time we are thinking about ourselves, then the selfishness will come in. And you know why, why capitalism is horrible? Why? Because everybody is about themselves. You know, I'm sitting here talking, I, I really wanted to talk to you about one reality in America. Everybody think America is genuine. Uncle Edward is sitting there, and he's from America. He, you know, we know people who are hungry in America. And you know, when we talk to people, you know, why are you hungry? And Bill Gates has billions, right? Warren Buffett has billions. You know, they have charities. But the concept of capitalism, why should we feed people whom Allah Allah what it? He would have fed them. It's not my job to feed, it's Allah's job. And our condition as Ummah is becoming this way now. It's not my job for this person to be fed. This is why the Sahaba, the Prophet in Mecca, installed the concept of sacrifice. I have to prioritize my brothers and sisters first. And this is what we need to have in order to build that strong Ummah. Then when the Prophet moved to Medina, we're sitting in a building now. Look at this building. Just reflect on it. What is it made of? One material? No. Multiple materials. It's made of bricks, maybe, right? Cement, woods, plastic. Why do we have to have all this? Because each one of these material plays a role. And this is how I want to us to understand we are as a woman, we have a role. And now, if each one of us play the role that they should be playing, then we will have this nice building. And then we will have this nice uh, ummah, this nice society and a nice ummah that is found on top of Allah. So the, the Prophet wasallam during these 13 years, he built the top of Allah in the heart of the Sahaba. Allah Azza wa said in the Quran, أَفَمَنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ عَلَى تَقْوَى مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانِ وَرِضْوَانٍ خَيِّرٌ أَمَّنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ عَلَى شَفَى جُرُفِ نَهَارٍ فَنْهَارٍ مِنْ نَهَارٍ مِنْ نَهَارٍ مِنْ نَهَارٍ Have you experienced earthquake? May Allah protect you. Actually, I have. We were in Jordan one time. And it's very horrible. It's scary. But as soon as the earthquake, it was a small magnitude. The windows were broken. The building was cracking. And the same magnitude, or higher magnitude, will hit Tokyo or in Japan, the buildings will bounce, move a little bit and bounce and come back straight. They don't fall. No. Why? Because of the foundation. Because of the material. That is why if the woman at individual level first, if we build ourselves on top of Allah, we will be like uh, you know, Tokyo buildings. We might be going to fitna, we might be going to trials, but our iman will never fall. That's why someone who has iman will never steal. Someone who has iman will never commit zina. 
Someone who has iman will never sleep hunger or fed while their neighbor is, is filled, is, is hungry. And this is what, you know, when we see that our problems are too many and we are not able to solve them, because the foundation of the taqwa is not there. And that's why, whatever we are going through this, uh, through, through this now, is this earthquake. Because the foundation is really not good, we are breaking into pieces. And that's why the Prophet also took his time and built this jail of the Sahaba, who when they migrated to Medina, they are ready. They are ready to build institutions which is the next topic. The first thing that the Prophet ﷺ did was building a masjid. How many masjids do we have in Kano? In India, actually, when um, our organization was built back in 1968, it was the only masjid in Indianapolis. It was in a basement. And African-American brothers, they actually worked hard with the immigrants who came, they moved from a basement to renting a place, to buy a new place. Now in Indianapolis, we, we have about 20 something mosquitoes. Yeah. But now, the question I have is not how many mosquitoes we have. What is the role of the mosquitoes? What the role of the Is the mosquitoes playing its role or not? The message of the Prophet was in place to pray and then go home. The message of the Prophet was a shelter. The message, I, I hear Sheikh Ibn Osman was asking the government, the, the, uh, political, the politicians to, to build shelters. The message, the message of the Prophet, the message of the Prophet was a place where hungry people would come and be fed. The, Prophet, the message of the Prophet was a palace where he would receive the guest diplomatic court. The message of the Prophet was a place where you can come and feel tranquility. Today our messages, just pray the Alhamdulillah, which is good. But the role of the Masajid is Madaris. They are schools. Not school that gives you PhD, nor school that will teach you morality. Today, you know, one time I was giving khutbah, after khutbah, I'm sorry. Somebody came to me and he was drunk in, uh, in the masjid. He said, you know what? Allah, I'm drunk. He said, I can tell this. I smell it and I see it. And wallahi, when I was talking to this man, another individual, how would you let someone who's drunk come to the masjid? I said, where do you want him to go? Go back to the bar again? The masjid, if we are saying the masjid is only for pious people, it looks like you are saying that the hospital is only for healthy people. The masjid is a place where people would come and learn. The masjid, you know, subhanAllah, you know, I, I, we can talk for hours. But the man who come and urinate in the message of the Prophet, right? That's a horrible thing. But the Prophet made it a teaching moment. Where he told him not to remove well, let him finish. Let him finish urinating in the masjid. Today in our masjid, I don't know if you have the same problem or not. You know, our youth today they cut their hair in a weird way and then you know dress differently and all these things, right? They come to the masjid. I would welcome them in the masjid. The reason why, if I don't welcome them in the masjid, the drug cartels will welcome them on the streets. The churches will welcome them in their churches. The 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 the, 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 the bad friends would welcome them. So when the message of the Prophet is, is an example of building an institution. That when we talk about building an institution in a civil society, it is not Ministry of Finance. I'm not talking about you know Ministry of uh, Education. No. In the neighborhood that we are in. How can we transform the masjid to learn from the example of the Prophet ﷺ, make the masjid a place where we build people, we build capacities. The best of the leaders are those who graduate from the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. The second concept, after building institutions, and the best institutions are neighborhood institutions. Neighborhood institutions, I don't know if the concept of non-profit is, is, I think it's common here. Jabayat. Establishing jama'iyah that are, are based from the masjid. The goal of this jama'iyah or association is feeding hungry people. The goal of this jama'iyah is fighting drug addiction. The goal of this jama'iyah is bringing, fighting ignorance or literacy in the society. Each one of us will be specialized in a particular thing. 
and then we will come together and bring all this expertise together and the result will be manifested in our society. Now what is the problem we have, we don't have too many of these institutions and then our effort is divided. And then we are only feeding people, we are not teaching people how to cut the fish. And that is why the second thing that I would like to talk about is building markets. The market is essential. You know, alhamdulillah, now we have, we have started seeing scholars who are together, business, businessmen and businesswomen. Before, you are an imam, you have to be confined in the masjid. You are a sheikh, you have to be under the mercy of the wealthy man. This is not how our scholars were. You know, Ibn Rushd al-Hafid, the book that we read in the Islamic University, he was an example of a faqi, and at the same time, someone who is knowledgeable in tip, medicine. You know, uh, today, every, actually, by the way, every science that you find at the beginning, Al, it's an Islamic and Arabic. Algebra, Khawarizmi, what else? Algorithm. Algorithm. Yes. So these are Arabic terms or, uh, from Muslim scholars, actually. So these are the people, the example of restoring our dignity. We want Imams to have expertise in other fields as well. We want our students who go to uh, I'm sorry, secular schools. We don't want them to be specialized in only science. No, I want them to be specialized in science and at the same time in what is that? We, we want our students who go to Islamia, we call them Islamia, Islamia, right? We want them to be specialized in medicine. I want my doctor to be a sheikh. I want the imam who leads me in the taraweeh to be a, a, a doctor, a hafid of Guru, Kitab Allah. Then we will bring the dunya and the akhirah together. Wallahi, the moment we fell, in the moment we start separating secular knowledge or science from Islam. And that is what the Prophet sent Zayd to learn, I think, Syriania or so, in 17 days. These same people, the, the Sahaba, who were Arab regularly, who were barefooted, they did not have even good dress. Within 100 or 150 years, they became leaders in science. Why? Because they took the love of the Bible and the law. The institution that the Prophet ﷺ built in the folk Muslim, in that world. And then we were talking a little bit about the market. Finance should not be separated from our life. You know, today, you have, you, as an imam, you go and give football. And you see in the audience, people who do not have food to eat tonight. You think they listen to your football? No. no. Poverty, finding poverty, is an essential thing in our deen. Poverty, subhanAllah, that's why the Prophet Allah, Allah, Allah says about the world, Give them from the wealth that I have entrusted you. So the wealth that we have, the money that we have, it belongs to Allah, it doesn't belong to us. And therefore we have to operate it on according to the teachings of Allah. The first thing is avoiding the haram. And that's why the market concept in Islam is based on fairness. It's not like capitalism. Nor it is like socialism or, or communism, where everyone owns everything. That's a fantasy, it's not reality. In the market in Islam is a fair market where you would bring your merchandise and then the demand and supply will dictate how the price are set. The Prophet doesn't even refuse to set the price. But he put the foundation of a fair market. What did he put? Ghish. Cheating is not permissible. Today you go to our markets, cheating is what? It's a norm. You see the businessmen swear by Allah, Wallahi, this is original and it's fake. You see people who are monopolizing or hoarding things so that they make the food expensive on people. And the Prophet ﷺ says, the market that the Prophet was founded is a market that does not have taxes. You know, governments take taxes. Where do the taxes are going? They're not better than anything. In an Islamic market, there is zakah. And the zakah is 2.5% once you meet the threshold. And wallahi, if we apply these three things, the concept of zakah, 
the concept of solar power, the concept of endowment, we would be sufficient. Today, Africa, how many countries are indebted to the World Bank? IMF. All of us. And then the problem is that we are not paying, not only we, but generation to come, we are paying this money. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says, riba And this money is going to Swiss Bank, to New York banks, to, to Paris banks. This money is coming from Qatar. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, for a reason, He says riba is not permissible. And now, in an Islamic society, if we apply these three concepts, we don't need to take one from anyone. Our forefathers, they used to cult, but they had they farms. They didn't need loan from Europe or anywhere to survive. Did they? Did they? they did not. So, did this, when these three concepts were applied, the time of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz was an, 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 an example. And I'll take it long, inshallah, make it short. The, the time of Omar, in that to where Allah, there is no one who will take the zakat. Why? Because the, the, there's fair wealth redistribution. So this will be, inshallah, the last portion. Uh, and then we will open, inshallah, the floor for comments and, uh, and Q&A session. Going back to the same question that I asked at the beginning. What is your duty as a civic individual? To answer this question, we will answer another question, which is, whose responsibility? We established, we've established that it is everyone's responsibility to make sure that this Ummah is a healthy Ummah. Do not worry if somebody is not doing their job. It's just you. And now, ask yourself as a Muslim individual, brother or sister, where do I start? The first thing is work on yourself. You know, when you are flying, they say, in case of lack of oxygen, wear your oxygen mask first before you help someone else. Because if you don't wear your own, you will actually pass out and you cannot help yourself. Let alone help the, next, the person next to you. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says better than this in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, hu anfusakum awwalan, thumma ahlihum. Protect yourself first. So work on yourself first. Now, how do you work on yourself? First, have consciousness of Allah. Everything you do in your life, ask this, please Allah or not. Please, if it doesn't, please Allah, stop. Please. Whether somebody is watching you or not, stop because Allah, if you apply that concept, Allah Azza wa Jalla will put barakah in every single thing that you do. And the taqwa of Allah is not fearing Allah. The taqwa of Allah is consciousness of Allah. Being mindful of Allah Azza wa Jalla. When you are mindful of Allah, Allah the solution will come from where you, where you do not even expect. Allah says this in the Quran. The second thing is your family. The biggest favor you could do to your society is taking care of your family. No one will take care of your family. This is your responsibility. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to ask you on the day of judgment, have you discharged your responsibility toward this family or not? And if you are able to do really well with your family, I did well with my family, this person did well with their family, the whole society will be good because we have healthy families. Because the nucleus of a healthy society is a healthy family, which is the nucleus of a of healthy individual, which is the, the, the basic foundation. And then, go to your neighbors. Reach out to your neighbors. Mazar and Jibreel will you see Ibn Jari Hatta Bonat to Anam say what it is. Jibreel kept advising me, the Prophet says, about my neighbor until I thought when my neighbor would be one of those who will inherit me when I die. Check on your neighbors. See how they are doing. Wayam Naun and Naun is actually neighborly help. We think it's insignificant, but it's very significant. A healthy neighborhood, it means a safe neighborhood. Because if we come as a neighbor together and we make sure that safety and the security of our neighborhood is our top priority, no intruder will come. Maybe they will come once, but they will not come again. Then think about the woman. This is the hierarchy. But once we establish these priorities, 
the Ummah will automatically be the Ummah that we are desired to be. The financial aspect that I was talking a little bit about earlier that we did, uh, I, I talked about the market part. But there is one concept that I wanted to talk about before we finish. The concept of brotherhood. You know, now if you don't know the name, the person, the, the, the name of the person you say, my brother or my sister. But when you say, you call someone my brother or my sister, you are actually entering into a contract. And every contract has obligations and has rights. And most of the time now, we always care about our rights in the contract. We forget our, our, our obligations. Always ask by yourself, what is my obligation toward my brother or my sister? And the Prophet when he did this brotherhood concept in between the Muhajirin and the Ansar, these people used to fight for four years, or over actually. These people were enemy towards one another. But within a few weeks, these people turned into brothers and sisters. Why did the Prophet do this? If we are not treating one another as brothers and sisters, there is no Ummah. Allah, there is no Ummah. Forget about it. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Indeed, the Mu'mins are not friends. They are brothers and sisters. And these brotherhood, this relationship, Allah is going to ask you about it. In fact, the brotherhood in Islam is better than biological brotherhood. Wallah, a blood, a blood brother could not be better than a Muslim brother or a Muslim sister. Why? Because your blood brother or sister, what happened to them? It is related to your biological aspect. What, the, what happens to our body when we die? We get buried, right? And then the body will be dissolved. And listen to what Allah says. On the day of judgment, you will be running away from your own siblings. But on the other hand, look at your brother and sister in Islam. Allah says, In the of Allah says, ونزعنا ما في صدورهم من غل إخوان على سرور متقابلين. Your brother in Islam, you are will be running towards one another, facing one another, and this is the brotherhood that will be lasting. I want us to go back to our neighborhood and say, my neighbor, you are my neighbor, you are my brother, you are my sister, and from today, I have obligations and I have rights, and we have we will reciprocate these rights. And let's build together and let's make the building of this Ummah our top priority. Last but not least, our Ummah is a struggle. Our Ummah is going through a difficult time. But we will never lose hope. Never. Because we are the Ummah that Allah Azza wa Jalla has selected to make, it, to make it the best Ummah. As if Allah Azza wa Jalla said, save the best for Allah. We are the Ummah that will be witnesses on other Ummahs on the Day of Judgment. We are the Ummah that Allah Azza wa Jalla preferred above any Ummah that He has created. We are the Ummah of La Ilaha illallah. We are the most and more importantly, we are the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And He says about this Ummah, this is the Ummah Mahfum. Allah Azza wa Jalla has had mercy on them. So I'm going to send this invitation. Allah will protect this woman. Inshallah. But are you willing to be part of the movement or not? Do you want to get the blessing of being part of the element that are building this woman or not? I will leave you with this question. Ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to bless you. Ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect you. Ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to safeguard you. Ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect this woman. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to unite between our hearts. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to remove fitna from our hearts and animosity toward one another. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla just like the events of brothers and sisters in this video, to make us brothers and sisters in the year after in the Jannah. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla for anyone who's going through a difficult time to ease their matter. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to remove the challenges in front of us. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make the difficulties and obstacles turn them into opportunities for us. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make, not to make this video our biggest concern. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make the Akhira our biggest concern. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect our youth, protect our professionals. We ask Allah Azza to protect our elderly. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect our sisters. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect our children from any harm that comes from themselves or from anyone else. Subhanallah.